This is a story of money and power. A film about the American dream and three men who made it come true. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, and J. Pierpont Morgan. They and others like them took a young nation of farmers and artisans and produced an industrial complex unsurpassed on the face of the earth. What were they like, these men whose lives would have such a profound effect on their fellow man? I came to America from Scotland at 12 years of age. I started to work in a Pittsburgh cotton mill for a dollar twenty a week. By the time I was 40, I was making $300,000 a week. Is it any wonder I consider America the greatest country in the world? They said I never smiled. Not true. Every time I bought another oil refinery or made another million dollars, I smiled. So actually, I smiled quite a lot. I never thought of myself as handsome. I was fat and had a large bulbous nose that was afflicted with a skin condition. Still, I was popular with the ladies. Perhaps it was partly my wealth. I was to die leaving a personal fortune of $68 million. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, J. Pierpont Morgan. Three of the country's first and biggest of a new breed of American. The big businessman. What sort of men were they? Robber barons or industrial statesmen? Whatever they were, they were colorful and the subject of many an article, editorial, and cartoon. One humorist who wrote about them constantly was Finley Peter Dunn, the creator of fiction's first Irish-American bartender, Mr. Dooley. J. Pierpont Martin, Andrew Carnegie, and John D. Rockefeller. Uh, I mean, Rockefeller. Funny thing is, how everybody is saying they typify the American success story, from rags to riches. Well, that's all I think it is, a story. And if all the facts be known, rags to riches is the exception rather than the rule. In America, no matter what they say, it's easier to go from riches to riches than it is from rags to riches. Before the Civil War, there was much manufacturing, but the enterprises were generally family-owned and operated. You got your furniture from the local cabinet maker, your shoes from the neighborhood shoemaker, and your meat from the local butcher. All of this was to change with the war. To fight this first modern war, great quantities of material had to be manufactured and moved. To finance it, the government needed money. Banks, factories, and railroads suddenly assumed a new importance. As in all wars, there were those who died and those who made fortunes. Among the latter was young Morgan. He purchased hundreds of cases of carbines declared defective by the government at three fifty dollars apiece and then sold them directly to General Fremont for $22. Not a bad profit. And anyway, they weren't that defective. All they did was blow off the thumb of the soldier firing them, and that only occasionally. With the war finally over and the South in ruins, the industrialists and bankers of the North began to make use of the huge masses of capital they had accumulated. The war had united North and South. The industrialists would join East to West. The country was on the move, people heading westward, putting down roots. And every new town, every settlement, no matter how remote, needed goods to grow on. The land they settled was vast, huge forests, plains, rivers, and mountains, 335,000 square miles of coal. Under the coal and often beyond it, oil and iron. Lake Superior rimmed with iron. And 75 miles northwest of Duluth, the Merritt brothers discovered the Mesabi, grandmother of them all, the richest iron range in the world, seemingly inexhaustible and easy to get at. As one of the Merritt boys remarked at the time, 
If we had gotten mad and kicked the ground right where we stood, we could have thrown up 64% ore. We had the resources, and we had the natural avenues of transportation for them. To our Atlantic ports came another factor in the rise of industrial America, a cheap labor force. It's true. Right here at the dock, they sign you up for work. And they say, if you're lucky, you can get a job that pays as much as a half a buck a day. We know what produces bars of steel, but what produces men of steel? Perhaps the times, the times following the Civil War, called for a new type of man. Men to build new empires in railroading, industry, and finance. There were times that called for men of steel, and the biggest man of steel was a small Scottish immigrant by the name of Andrew Carnegie. His intelligence, industry, and charm were to take him in a few short years from working a bobbin in a cotton mill for $1.20 a week to supervising a telegraph office to running the Pennsylvania Railroad. Instead of spending the money he earned, Carnegie preferred to invest it. By the age of 30, he had an annual income of $50,000 from shrewd investments. And when he came across the Bessemer process for converting iron into steel, he built on the banks of the Monongahela the greatest steel plant in the country. Soon it was turning out more Bessemer steel than all of the other American mills combined, bringing the public better steel at lower prices. Carnegie was understandably proud of his achievement. Two pounds of iron or stone mined upon Lake Superior and transported 900 miles to Pittsburgh. One pound and one half of coal mined and manufactured into coke and transported to Pittsburgh. One half pound of lime mined and transported to Pittsburgh. And these four pounds of material manufactured into one pound of steel for which the customer pays one cent. Ah, the iron crown has been placed on the brow of Pennsylvania. Year by year, Carnegie's steel empire grew. New mills, a fleet of Great Lakes steamers, a port town on Lake Erie, a connecting railroad. It was an empire, but it wasn't big just for the sake of bigness. New technological processes demanded new methods of manufacturing in all industries. In 1889, Carnegie wrote a book called The Gospel of Wealth, in which he said that the life of a rich man should fall into two periods. The first, acquiring wealth. The second, distributing it for the general welfare. There is no doubt that Carnegie lived up to the first part of his plan, acquiring wealth. His personal income reached 15 million a year. But when it came to sharing his wealth with his workers, working 12 hours a day, seven days a week, in an inferno of heat and noise, Carnegie's workers averaged less than $460 a year in wages. And when they attempted to better their lot by unionizing and going on strike, Carnegie refused to bargain, preferring instead to replace them with those more understanding and hungry. Rich men are trustees of their wealth and should administer it for the good of the public. with his workers, he was generous to others. For music lovers, he built Carnegie Hall in New York. For scientific research, Carnegie Institute of Technology in Pittsburgh. For those interested in stopping war, he founded the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Best known of all his philanthropies, however, were the over 2,800 free libraries he built throughout the country, built and equipped on condition that the local authorities provided the site and maintenance. Has Andrew Carnegie given you a library yet? He will. He'll not escape him. Before he dies, he hopes to crowd a library on every man, woman, and child in the country. He's given them to cities, villages, towns, whistling stations. They're turned down gas houses and poor houses to put up libraries. In another year, every house in Pittsburgh that's not a blast furnace will be a library. In some places, all the buildings is libraries. If you write him for an autograph, he sends you a library. But no beggar has ever turned away empty-handed from the door. A panhandler knocks and asks for a glass of milk and a roll. 
No, sir, says Andrew Carnegie. I'll not pauperize this unworthy man. Nothing is worse than for a beggar man to be made a pauper of. Yet let it not be said of me that I give nothing to the poor. Saunders, give the man a library. Andrew Carnegie, in owning the iron ore deposits, the steel manufacturing plants, and his own railroad line, created a forerunner of the first steel trust. It was practical, for it eliminated wasteful competition and duplication. The average citizen benefited because he was able to acquire iron and steel products for truly reasonable prices. In the rise of big business, the trust was to play a vital and constructive role. Of course, not all the trusts benefited the public. Take the ice trust, for example. What's going on? The price of ice is more than doubled. That always goes up in the summertime, lady. But I can't afford to pay the increase. So what do you want from me? I don't set the prices. But all the food in the ice box, the milk. Hey, look, lady, I only deliver the stuff. Thousands living in the slums had to do without ice. As a result, food rotted, milk soured, and many people, particularly children, became ill. Then, in the winter, the coal trust raised the price of coal. Thousands had to do without heat, making influenza and pneumonia commonplace. These poor people filled the charity hospitals, supported by the very same millionaires who'd been partly responsible for making them ill in the first place. Trust Mr. Dooley not to let such things go on without some comment. When the average middle-class American sits himself down to breakfast, eats bacon packed by the Beef Trust, seasons his eggs with salt made by the Michigan Salt Trust, sweetens his coffee with sugar refined by the American Sugar Trust, lights his American Tobacco Company cigar with a Diamond Match Company match, and rides to work on a bicycle built by the Bicycle Trust. from the influence of the trusts, though when they sat down to eat, they could be counted on not to worry unduly. Did you hear about Armand's dinner party? Everyone on horseback, I understand. Clever! Yes, Armand's such a wit. I think he's cute. Mink-lined carriages, diamond-studded dog collars. One millionaire built a replica of a Scotch castle with 40 guest suites and a personal bagpiper whose assignment was to march around in the morning to wake up the guests. There were other millionaires who seemed to think of wealth as something to be used solely to create more wealth. Prominent among this group was John D. Rockefeller, shown here at the age of 95. He had already made and given away billions. But for young John D., the beginning was less than auspicious. His first job as an assistant bookkeeper paid $5 a week. The substance he was later to make his fortune in, oil, was already widely in use. Hawked at carnivals as rock oil or snake oil and sold as a cure-all for cholera, liver complaints, and consumption. Purely by accident, one of its users discovered that if you put a match to it, it made an excellent fuel. Its value was recognized instantly by young Rockefeller. Getting into the refining business, Rockefeller went around buying up local refineries and welding them into a single company. He was the most silent and secretive of all the big businessmen, shunning ostentation and publicity. He made unholy deals with railroads, forcing them to return part of what he had paid them to transport his oil. These payments, called rebates, were paid to him not only for the oil he shipped, but the oil shipped by his competitors as well. Control of the pipelines followed, and by 1882, Rockefeller's Standard Oil Trust controlled 95% of all the oil refining business in the country. Of course, he had to bend a few laws to do it. On April 13, 1907, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis fined Standard Oil over $29 million for breaking the federal law against rebating. 
$29 million. Devil the sentinels. <laughs> Can't exactly remember what the charge was they arrested him on, but the general idea is John D. was going around loaded up to the guards with standard oil, exceeding the speed limit in acquiring money. The judge says to him, you're an old offender, and I'll have to make an example of you. $29 million or 58 million days. Call the next case, Mr. Clark. Rockefeller appealed and won. The higher court set aside the penalty, and Standard Oil paid nothing. Rockefeller was absolutely ruthless when it came to crushing competition. He bought out, froze out, and some say even bombed out all who stood in his way. On more than one occasion, the oil fields of competitors who would not yield to him were rocked by mysterious explosions. In response to charges of utter ruthlessness, Rockefeller replied, The American beauty rose can be produced in the splendor and fragrance which bring cheer to its beholder only by sacrificing the early buds which grow up around it. This is not an evil tendency in business. It is merely the working out of a law of nature and a law of God. In 1889, the Supreme Court of Ohio held Standard Oil to be in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Rockefeller replaced it with a holding device, Standard Oil of New Jersey. By the time the United States Supreme Court declared that to be illegal in 1911, Rockefeller had retired from business and decided to devote his time to philanthropy. To the University of Chicago, he gave 35 million. Other millions went to the Baptist Church, the YMCA. And since he was personally opposed to drinking, smoking, and other vices, the Anti-Saloon League. The money pumped from these wells through Rockefeller's philanthropic pipelines totaled over $500 million. As big business developed, it entered a new phase, a shift from industrial to finance capitalism. Wall Street began to exercise increasingly greater influence over all business activity. No banker was more influential in this new phase than John Pierpont Morgan. Unlike the humbly born Carnegie and Rockefeller, Morgan was the son of a millionaire banker. But his inherited wealth was nothing compared to the fantastic personal fortune he was to amass. There was still big money to be made in railroads, and it was in railroads that Morgan first displayed his financial genius. He consolidated, merged, and stabilized all of the major railway systems in the East, placing them on a firm financial basis. He then set about becoming the Wizard of Wall Street. When criticized for bringing about the financial ruin of many a competitor, he replied, I am not in Wall Street for my health. Railroads steamship lines, manufacturing, and mining companies, Morgan financed and controlled them all. No profit-making venture seemed remote from his grasp. Pierpont Morgan calls in one of his office boys, the president of a national bank, and he says, James, says he, take some change out of the damper and run out and buy Europe for me. I intend to reorganize it and put it on a pay and basis, he says. And call the Sultan, the Tsar, and the Emperor William, and tell them we won't be needing their services after next week, he says. Give them a year's salary in advance, he says. And oh, James, that bookkeeper near the door doesn't seem to be doing much these days. You better put him in charge of the continent. Morgan's greatest business coup began as a discussion in his library and ended on a golf course. When it was over, he, not Carnegie, owned United States Steel. Mr. Carnegie, I hope you find these terms acceptable. $225,639,000 for all the bonds and stocks of the company. A payment of $400 million to be later increased by the addition of extra common stock for your partners. I accept. The deal consummated, it occurred to Morgan that he and Carnegie had not met for some time. He telephoned the Scotsman. Uh, Mr. Carnegie, I would like to see you. Why don't you come to visit me at my office at 23 Wall Street? Mr. Morgan, since the distance from Wall Street to 51st Street is no greater than the distance from 51st Street to Wall Street, and since I am your senior, I respectfully suggest that you come to see me. Morgan agreed. Mr. Carnegie, 
I want to congratulate you on being the richest man in the world. I made one mistake, Pierpont, when I sold out to you. I should have asked you for a hundred million more. Well, you would have got it if you had. In 1895, the wealth controlled by Morgan was so vast that he was able to lend the United States government $62 million in gold to restore its low reserve to a safe $100 million. At the height of his fortune, the assets controlled by Morgan were in excess of $11 billion, quite an accomplishment for a man whose two major interests outside of business were collecting art treasures and playing solitaire. When criticized for a lack of concern with the public welfare, he replied, I owe the public nothing. The public disagreed, particularly those workers in the newly formed United States Steel Corporation who were struggling along on a 12-hour day for less than $1,000 a year. In 1901, they went on strike. We are unalterably opposed to any extension of union labor and advise subsidiary companies to take a firm position where these questions are concerned. The strikers claim they'd be disappointed in Pierpont Morgan not recognizing their rights. Well, my advice to them is, boys, never ask for your rights, take them. And don't let anyone ever give them to you. A right that Santa you for nothing has something the matter with it. Even though President McKinley was a great defender of labor, he was not strongly opposed to the big business trusts. But upon his assassination, a man who was to make a name for himself as a trust buster took over the White House. Morgan was far from pleased. One of the first things the president aimed his sights at was a new Morgan Railroad Trust, the Northern Securities Company. Morgan offered a simple solution to President Roosevelt. Tell the president that if we've done anything wrong, to send his man to my man, and they can fix it up. I'm afraid, Mr. Morgan, that that sort of thing simply cannot be done. In 1907, a financial panic hit the country. In desperation, the president turned to Morgan, and Morgan saved the day. He organized a group of bankers who managed to stem the tide of panic and preserve the solvency of major banks and corporations. Roosevelt proved appreciative. Our aim is not to do away with corporations. On the contrary, these big aggregations are a necessary part of modern industrialism. We're not attacking corporations, but endeavoring to do away with any evil in them. It's a bit puzzling now, is it not, how our president seems somewhat confused by the question of the trusts. He seems to be saying the trusts are hegeous monsters built up by the enlightened enterprise of the men who have done so much to advance progress in our beloved country. On the one hand, I would stamp them out underfoot. On the other hand, not so fast. John D.'s comment was brief and to the point. The combination is here to stay. Towards the public at large, Morgan was contemptuous. He was, however, a deeply religious man of the Episcopalian faith, and to that church he gave generously with sizable contributions to St. George's Church in New York City, large gifts towards the construction of St. John the Divine, and contributed handsomely to St. Paul's Cathedral in London. In addition to his religious contributions, he donated many priceless art treasures to the Metropolitan Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, and the Metropolitan Opera. We have seen a pattern emerge that is not untrue of most of the early industrial titans. A rise from humble beginnings to great personal wealth a seemingly ruthless disregard for what we now consider good business practices and a desire in later years to use their great wealth for the public welfare. What effect did all of this have on the country? It changed it completely. Products that now roll endlessly from assembly lines into the American home are a direct result of this early desire for bigness. The industrialists may have been ruthless, but one thing is certain. They were inevitable products of their times. They had the vision to put all of the elements together. The influx of new immigrant labor, great untapped natural resources, and emerging production technology 
and new worldwide markets. What were they then? These men whose actions seem so paradoxical. Reckless adventurers? Men of daring and imagination who made the American dream come true. Robber barons or industrial statesmen? You decide. 